Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. All right, well, Shabbat Shalom. As you know, and, and as Earl just alluded to, we've been sending out teams every week uh, to evangelize, uh, sending them out two by two, following Yeshua's role model well, with his own disciples. But even if you aren't part of these formal teams, we are all called to proclaim the good news and to share the gospel. So all of us, each of us, need to be prayerfully looking for opportunities, whether you're part of a team or not, looking for opportunities every day with people the Lord puts you in contact with. A store clerk, uh, a hairdresser, uh, a gym member, a salesman, a classmate, a coworker, a neighbor, a cashier, a security guard, a janitor, a fellow shopper, a, a sports team member, a, a fellow customer. Uh, but this begs the question, of course, when we do be obedient and speak to these people, what message do we actually share with them? What is the good news that I'm supposed to proclaim? Do I really know and can I properly articulate and communicate the gospel? So today I want us to take a step back uh, and look at what I'm, I'm going to call gospel basics, uh, the core, the essence uh, of, the, of the gospel. And to help us, I'm going to use an acrostic of the very word gospel. So put that in the overhead, uh, just G-O-S-P-E-L. Uh, and as we go through the, um, uh, the truths of the gospel, I want you to be asking yourselves these three questions for each of the, the letters uh, of the word gospel. Uh, number one, am I believing it? Number two, am I living it? And number three, am I sharing it? And to get at this, we're going to look at our text today, which is Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Uh, so turn with me, if you can, to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And in and Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul says this. And you all were dead, because in the plural, you, you in the Greek, so you all were, were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. And among them we too all formerly lived, in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of, the, of the, both the flesh and the mind, the things we think. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, that's a great verse right there, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Messiah. By grace you've been saved. And raised us up uh, with him uh, and seated us with him in heavenly places in the Messiah Yeshua. In order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace uh, and kindness towards us in Messiah Yeshua. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one should boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. Hallelujah. So I want us to see six core truths of the gospel for each of the six letters of the, the word gospel. And we're going to start, with, with, of course, with the letter G. So we put that on the overhead. The uh, letter G stands for God's character. The gospel begins and ends with God. The gospel is God-centered from, from, from start to finish. It all centers around who he is. Paul starts Ephesians 2 talking about the sinfulness of man in verses 1 to 3. We're going to get to that in a minute uh, with the letter O. But, but first, uh, uh, the hinge verse, the verse on which everything changes is the next verse, verse 4, which starts with the words, but God. And then notice all the things God does in this text. So look at the overhead, verses 4 and 5. Because of his great love, he made us alive together with Messiah. Verse 6, he raised us up with him. Verse 6 again, he seated us with, in, in, with Messiah in the heavenly places. Verse 7, so that in the, in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace. Do you see who's doing all the action? God. It's God who is the one who's active. 
Uh, and all the references uh, in, in, uh, uh, to, to us in this passage, are in the Greek, they're in the passive voice. So look at verse 5. You have been saved. Not you saved yourself. You were saved. Uh, this happened to you from the outside. Look at verse 8. By grace you have been saved. This has been done to you through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God. God did this. God is the one who did this. He does all this based on his character. His holiness, his justice, his wrath, his mercy, his love. They're all over this text, which creates a tension. So, for example, we see God's wrath mentioned in verse 3. Look at Ephesians 2, verse 3. All of us lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of both our flesh and our thoughts, like the rest, we were by nature children of wrath. Then look at the very next verse, Ephesians 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, made us alive with Messiah. So we see in the, right in the same passage, both God's wrath uh, and his love described here. Both his justice and his mercy. Both are here. And so we can't uh, ignore or minimize any of these attributes of God. If we're going to truly understand the gospel, uh, we must embrace and exalt the entirety of God's character. We must acknowledge and seek to understand both his love and his wrath, both his mercy and his justice. Uh, and most of all, his absolute, unadulterated holiness. This is the key understanding the whole gospel. Because if we have a small view of God, we're going to have a small view of the gospel. If we have a glorious view of God, we have a glorious view of the gospel. And so we have to be careful to see God for who he is. And in the gospel, not to see him as some, merely as a means to an end. Because there's so much out there today being sold as the gospel, but that prostitutes God uh, as merely a means uh, to, to worldly pleasure and prosperity and peace. So we're told, for example, put your faith in God and you can have everything you want, health and wealth and prosperity and success uh, and your best life now. Now think about this. If your best life is now, that must mean you're going to hell. <laughs> because if you're going to heaven, your best life wouldn't be now. <laughs> Uh, uh, so who'd want their best life now? <laughs> Yeshua says in John 16, the exact opposite of your best life now. He says, in this world, you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. We want our, be we want our best life uh, in, in the world to come. Yeshua is looking for those who live by faith, regardless of the trials and tribulations and the troubles they face. Hebrews eleven sixteen, For they're looking for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God's not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. But this power of positive thinking, prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all, uh, it's rampant today in America, and it's now infecting the rest of the world. We must stand against this perversion of the gospel. Let's we'll put this on the overhead. The gospel isn't come to God and get stuff. No, the gospel is come to God and get God. He is the one we want. He is the one we need. Yeshua is the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end of the gospel. The gospel starts with the nature and the character of God. God's character is the letter G in this word gospel. The next letter we'll put on the overhead in the gospel is the letter O which stands for the offense of sin. The offense of sin. This sadly is our response to who God is. Why? Because we rebel against him. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, following the ways of this world, uh, and the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. All of us also lived among them at one time gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. We were by nature deserving of wrath. And then Paul repeats it again, and he didn't get it in verse 5. Ephesians 2, 5, we were dead in our transgressions. 
This word trespass or transgressions uh, is to break the law, which is something we all have done. All of us. God says, don't eat from the tree. And and our sin nature immediately says, well, I'm going to eat from that tree. We don't want anyone, not even God, telling us what to do. Why? Because we're naturally rebellious and self-centered, not God-centered. We spurn God's authority. We spurn his authority. Think of it. This is the creator of the universe, the God who beckons storm clouds and they come. The God who tells the wind and the rain to blow uh, and to fall here and there, and they do it immediately. This is the God that says, to the mountains, you go there, and to the oceans, you stop here. And everything in all creation immediately responds in obedience to the creator. Until you get to you and to me. And we have the audacity uh, to look at him and say, no. No, we want to do things our way. We rebel, we transgress, we transgress, uh, and as a result, we are dead in our trespasses and our sins. And Paul repeats it in verses 1 and verse 5 for emphasis. You are dead in your trespasses now, and if nothing changes, you'll be dead in your trespasses forever. So this is our great problem. Understanding and communicating the gospel requires that we have to be clear about this problem. Indeed, this is typically and often the key missing link in most modern presentations of the gospel. We fail to adequately talk about sin. We fail to show the person that they are a sinner. We fail to show them the consequences of their sin. We fail to emphasize that it's not those individual sins that you've done this or this wrong, but that you have a sin nature. And most of all, we fail to exhort them to repent as a key plank of the gospel. Throughout the New Testament, whenever, whether it's Yochanan, Hamabil, John the Baptist, or Peter, or Paul, or Yeshua himself, whenever they would preach, the message and the emphasis was always this. Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Yeshua began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Yeshua's message was on repentance. But we don't even mention this today in most times when we see a presentation of the gospel. And what is repentance? What is teshuva? It's to turn around. It's to change your mind, to change your heart, to change your life. To hate your sin, to have a godly sorrow and remorse over it, and then to flee from it. To stop doing it, to turn from it, and to turn back to God. Our gospel has no power today because we don't show people that their, how their life compares uh, to the moral law of God and how, fall, how, fall, how much they fall short of this. We don't show them their need for a Savior, for a Redeemer. And we don't call them to turn from their sin and repent from it and to turn from their self and to turn to Yeshua uh, and to change. Instead, what do we do? We put this on the overhead. What's the typical line? God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, right? Now, does this message, which is nowhere in the Bible, by the way, but does this message cause a sinner to repent? What does a typical self-centered person say? God loves me? Awesome! I love me too! (laughs) God and I agree! God has a wonderful plan for my life? Oh, fantastic! I have a wonderful plan for my life too! (laughs) And if God just fulfills my plan, we'll be best buds! Do I want to go to heaven? Sure, who wouldn't? Do I want to avoid hell? Of course, uh, who wouldn't? What do I have to do? Uh, Just repeat this prayer? Um, How long is it going to take? I I only got a couple minutes. I'm busy. Two minutes? Okay, I guess I can do that. Yeah, let me pray it. Then I'm saved. Do you see how our modern gospel message says nothing about sin and repentance? Nothing about dying to self, about taking up your cross daily and following Yeshua regardless of the cost. Following Yeshua, even if it means hating mother and father and sister and brother and your very own life. You see that how in the modern gospel message, there's nothing about regeneration, about a whole new life, a whole new you. How you're, you're, you've died to the old you, And now you you live in newness of life, filled with the Spirit of Messiah, 
and you're reborn as a new creation in Yeshua. So preaching the gospel, the true gospel, the saving gospel, must emphasize our sin and our need for repentance. We must focus on mankind's problem. Our problem isn't that uh, we don't have our best life now, uh, or that our life's not going right, or that we've messed up here and there, uh, or we've done this wrong, this wrong or that wrong, or made some mistakes. That's not our ultimate problem. The problem is our sin nature. The problem is at the very core of our being, we rebel against God. And we're dead without him. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. Not almost dead, not kind of dead, not mostly dead or sort of dead, <laughs> but dead. There's a story of a, of, a, of a preaching professor who used to take his, true stories, to take his students every semester to, to a cemetery. Uh, and one by one, he, he'd have them preach, each student preach to the graves uh, and call the corpses to come to life. And of course, it was embarrassing and it was awkward and each student would get up and they would preach and call for the dead bodies to rise, to raise up and, and to resurrect and to come to life. Uh, and nothing would happen. And then the professor would say, when you preach to unbelievers, that's exactly what you're doing. Preaching to the dead. No matter how powerful your message might be that you're preaching, you're preaching to people who are spiritually dead and who will remain dead until God brings them to life. We need to realize that although God uses us, he has that he commands us to preach the gospel. Indeed, he says in Romans 10, verse 14, how can they even believe in one whom they've not heard of? of? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Nonetheless, it's only the Spirit of God that saves them. Not you, not me. Francis Schaeffer was asked once, what would you do if you had one hour to preach the gospel? And he said, I'd spend 45 to 50 minutes showing them their sin, and how they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And then I spend the last 10 to 15 minutes to laying out the plan of salvation. Uh, in Yeshua's atoning death and resurrection, and his need, their need to repent and to trust in the Lord. And then Schaefer said this, we put this on the overhead. He said, I believe that much of our evangelistic work today is vague and ineffective uh, and lacking in long-term fruit because we're too anxious uh, to get to the cure without having the man or the woman first realize their sickness. Uh, and their sickness is true moral guilt. Not just psychological guilt feelings, but true moral guilt before a holy God. So in preaching the gospel, you cannot gloss over the severity of sin. You know, in modern America, American culture, which is no longer a biblical culture, uh, please remember that we're sharing the gospel with people who don't believe in sin, who don't think that it's a big deal. People think, well, I'm not that bad. Uh, I've never killed anyone. Uh, I'm nice to my mother. <laughs> you know, surely if there is a God, uh, he'll take me to heaven. I'm not, I'm not one of those terrible people who deserve hell. But if you look at the scriptures, you'll see the severity of sin on page after page after page. You see that in our whole life, we're constantly in rebellion against God. And that God looks at the heart. You know, hatred is murder in God's eyes because we're murdering in our heart. And lust is adultery in God's eyes because we're committing it in our heart. And 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord doesn't look the way man looks. The man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And what about the heart? Uh, Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is able to judge your thoughts and intentions of your heart. And there's no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. And when the Lord looks at our heart, what does he see? Mark 7, 21. For from within, out of your heart, come evil thoughts and sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside uh, and defile you. The problem why we're, no, is why, why we're no longer cut to the quick when we read a list like this 
We, we don't cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Is that we have a man-centered perspective on sin. We'll put this on the overhead. Uh, the, the severity of sin and the punishment it deserves is not determined by how big or small we think the sin is, but by the one who sinned against. So, for example, if you sin against a rock, you're not very guilty. If you sin against a man, you're guilty. If you sin against an infinitely holy God, you're infinitely guilty. Next overhead. One sin before an infinitely holy God is infinitely serious before him, causing infinite separation from God. Thus, for Adam and Eve, one original sin came condemnation for, the whole, for all men. All, uh, uh, and, and, and all, came, our, our, all the sin natures, uh, all the effects of sin in the world today it came from this one original sin. All the murder, the rape, the wars, the violence, theft, your, your lying, your greed, your slander, your hatred, your immorality, your addiction, your pride. All the evil and injustice and sin, and sin in the world all came from this one original sin. And you and I have committed untold thousands and thousands, if not millions and millions of sins. Sins against an infinitely holy God that are deserving of infinite punishment and judgment. So we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And we cannot save ourselves. And so we need someone to give us life. That's the offense of sin. We are dead in our sins against an infinitely holy God, and therefore we deserve infinite judgment. And we can't save ourselves or give ourselves life. And this leads to the letter S, and the good news of the sufficiency of Yeshua. So in our gospel acrostic, we've got God's character, and number two, the offense of sin, and now number three, the letter S, the sufficiency of Yeshua the Messiah. Uh, and why this word sufficiency is so important is that we've got to realize how Yeshua is totally unique in who he is and what he's accomplished and what he's able to do to reconcile dead sinners and bring them to life before a holy God. Think about what we've talked about so far. I put this in the overhead. Uh, God is holy. We've offended him and sinned against him. He's just, and by his justice, he must punish sin. But at the same time, he's merciful and loving and desires to save sinners. So I want you to feel the tension here, this biblical tension. If you want to understand the heart of the gospel, you've got to feel this tension. How can God be both just and merciful towards sinners, uh, but be both just towards them and at the same time merciful towards them? Uh, that's the ultimate question of the Bible. How can a just God save rebellious sinners who rightly deserve his wrath. Now, in our modern secular culture, we don't appreciate this tension. We don't even see this divine dilemma. We just assume that if there is a God, uh, he must be loving and gracious and merciful and, and forgive sin. We bristle and are offended at the notion that God would punish sinners because we have a very man-centered view of God. And we no longer believe in objective morality and truth and absolute standards of right and wrong, of good and evil. Instead, we wag our finger accusingly at God. We put him on trial. We put him in the dock. And we say, how can you punish sinners? How can you let good people go to hell? But the question of the Bible is the exact opposite question. How, God, how can you be a just God, a righteous God, and still let rebels and sinners into your heaven? That's the question the Bible asks. And this makes perfect sense. Think about it. If, if a judge today were to find a criminal guilty of, of, of murder and rape and dismemberment and high treason and, uh, and terrorism, but nonetheless were to say to that guy, that criminal, that's okay, uh, uh, I know you're sorry, and you said you wouldn't do it again, so you can go free. I declare you innocent. If that happened, we would demand, we would rightly demand that judge to be off the bench in a heartbeat. We'd be up in arms at the unjustness of that judge. Because justice demands that the guilty be declared and be treated as guilty. And the innocent be declared and treated as innocent. So how can God, 
who's totally just, look at us who are totally guilty in our sin and say that we're innocent. Indeed, in this sense, God's forgiveness of our sin is actually a threat against his very character. God can't be just and just accept our sin and our rebellion and, and, and our cosmic treason uh, against his authority. So the question is, how can God be just and yet merciful to us, wicked sinners, at the same time? He puts on the overhead, uh, this is the ultimate question of the universe. How can God express his holy justice without condemning us in our sin? How can the Lord grant us salvation when his justice demands our condemnation? And the answer is the sufficiency of Messiah Yeshua. God has looked upon dead sinners, and what has he done? He has sent his son. He has sent his son, God in the flesh, Yeshua the Messiah, the son of God, the word made flesh, the Lord of the universe, the creator and the sustainer of all. Hebrews 1 verse 1, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, a Shekhinah, an exact stamp, a representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after Yeshua, after he made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now our fellow Jews, uh, and by the way, Muslims as well, uh, they have a problem with, with the deity of Messiah. I heard an evangelist tell how he, how he witnesses to, to a bunch of Muslims in the Middle East uh, recently. He was talking to a group of Muslims in, in, in North Africa about how Yeshua is God who's come down to us in the flesh to rescue us and save us and redeem us. And one of the Muslims immediately got up and screamed, that's not true. God would never debase himself by becoming a man. His character is far too great for that. And of course, our Jewish people have the same objection, right? And the evangelist said, I agree that God's character is great. And that's precisely why he came to earth as a man. And the Muslim said, wait a minute, I don't understand. So the evangelist said, let me tell you about how I met and then proposed to my wife. I met this girl. I got to know her. I fell in love with her. I wanted to marry her. And when it came time for me to tell her, how much I love to and ask her to marry me. Do you think I sent one of my friends to relay that message for me? And the Muslim said, no, of course not. You have to go do yourself. You have to go and be the one to tell her that you love her and to ask her to marry you. And the evangelist said, exactly. I need to go and tell her myself. Why? Because when you love someone, you go and tell them yourself. Because in matters of love, you must go yourself. And this is how I know God's character is great and infinitely loving. Because he loves us so much, he didn't send this prophet or that prophet. He didn't send Moses or Muhammad. He came himself. He came to us himself. And most of all, to show us how much he loved us by laying out his life for us to take upon himself the penalty for our sin that we deserved to bear and to therefore make a way for us to have a personal relationship with him. And then the Muslim said, well, you know, all religions are basically the same. Different terminology, but they're basically the same. It's like God's on top of the mountain. We're all at the bottom of the mountain. We all have different paths up to the top of the mountain. You've all heard this story, right? But in the end, we all end up in the same place. Then the evangelist said this. No, the truth is this. Yes, you're right. God's on top of the mountain. But this is the amazing story. God on top of the mountain didn't wait for you to try to find your way up. Instead, he came down the mountain to you in the person of Yeshua. He came to you where you are to bring you to himself. And this truth makes Yeshua faith. He makes Christianity, he said, we would say Messianic Judaism, 
different, radically different from every other religion on the planet. Yeshua is God come down the mountain to you. And he offers you a relationship with him through Yeshua. And this is totally unlike any other teaching, any other philosophy, any other religion in the history of the world. So we must proclaim who Yeshua is. Our Savior, our Lord, our King, our Messiah, our High Priest, our Redeemer, God in the flesh. And we must proclaim what he's done. Uh, and the good news that Yeshua has now lived the life you couldn't live. A life of perfect, sinless obedience to the Father. And he died the death you deserve to die. And he paid the price you couldn't pay. And he defeated the enemy you couldn't defeat. He was sinless, so death had no hold on him. But he voluntarily laid his life down for you. Uh, and died in your place as a substitute for you. He died to atone for your sin and mine. He died for us. He shed his blood on the cross in order to bear the, our sin on our behalf. And then God accepted his sacrifice and vindicated him by raising him from the dead on the third day. So what, what we see with, with Yeshua on the cross is God in the flesh experiencing the full judgment of sin. He took our sins, just like the scapegoat on Yom Kippur. All the sins of the people were confessed on him. He became our sin offering. This thus enabling our salvation. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He who knew no sin became sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God thus satisfies his justice and his wrath through the death of Yeshua, that by enabling us now to receive his mercy and his love. So I'll put this on the overhead. Is God just towards sin? Yes. Look at the cross. Is God merciful and loving towards sinners? Yes. Look at the cross. Yeshua lived the life you couldn't live and died the death you deserved to die and paid the price you could not pay. And conquer the enemy you could not conquer. Sin and death itself. For he rose from the dead, the first fruits of all who trust in him. Yeshua, he's alive, he's risen. He's alive and sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you and for me. This is what makes salvation possible for us. In this passage in Ephesians 2, we see this phrase, with Messiah or in Messiah, repeating four times in just a couple of verses. Look at Ephesians 2, 5. God made us alive together with Messiah. Alive with him. He's alive and we come to life in him. Verse 6, he seats us with him in heavenly places in Messiah Yeshua. He's ascended on high. Verse 7, so that in the ages to come, he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Messiah Yeshua. The gospel is the good news that you can be saved from your sin in and through and with Messiah Yeshua. It's so when a world full of religions, Yeshua stands alone. He alone is sufficient to save us from our sins and to reconcile us to a holy God and to bring us from death to life. Which leads to the question, then, how can all this happen? How can we be translated from death to life? Uh, this is the letter P in gospel. A personal response. So we've got God's character, the offense of sin, the sufficiency of Yeshua, and our number four, our, our P, our personal response. What do you need to do? Look at verse 8, Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you've been saved... Through faith. So grace is the grounds here, and faith is the means by which God saves you. Now, now why faith? Why is faith the means of, of salvation? Why not love, or, or humility, or, or joy, or peace, or, or wisdom? Why does God design faith as the only means of salvation? Because faith is a demonstration that we trust God, that we're submitted and surrendered to him, we're not depending on our works or our good deeds or our merits or our mitzvot or our righteousness. Faith is the anti-works. 
Faith is the realization there's nothing you can do to earn or merit your salvation. No amount of love you can show. No amount of kindness you can give. No amount of obedience you can accomplish. Faith is the humble admission there's nothing you can do for your salvation other than the trust in what's already been done for you. So put on the overhead. Faith is the one attitude of the heart that's the exact opposite of depending upon yourself. It's acknowledging our utter dependence upon the Lord. Now, buddy, by the way, a footnote here, one quick note on the Greek uh, text here. Uh, it, says that, it says in the Greek that grace is a gift from God, not based on works, so that no one would boast. Now, I know it's popular to preach this passage as saying that our faith is what's the gift from God. That's not what it actually says in the, in the text. Uh, if you look at the, the Greek grammar and the male and female the nouns and the grammatical structure and the agreement, the text does not say that faith is a gift. It says that God's grace is the gift, which makes sense because the Lord does require a response from you. We must choose whether to trust in Yeshua or not. If even our faith was nothing but a gift from outside, we'd have no choice. We'd be robots. But God gives us the ability to choose and holds you accountable for your choice. But the bottom line is salvation is a free gift based on what Yeshua has done, on what all we must do is repent and trust in him. That's a personal response. The response the Lord calls you to make, to turn from your sin and to turn from yourself and to turn to him. So, so the overhead, uh, so the gospel is not just information. It's an invitation. It's a divine invitation that demands a decision. It demands a response from you. The overhead, again, the gospel is just a mere statement of what Yeshua has done. It's a summons that describes what we must do. We must repent and trust in him. And so here's the important, important point, but in the overhead as well. When you're out there sharing the gospel, to share the gospel is to call people to repent and to trust in Yeshua. It's not just to give them information. It's to give them an invitation to surrender their life to the Messiah and to die to self and to take up their cross and to follow him. The gospel demands a personal response. So on our acrostic, we've got G, God's character, O, the offense of sin, S, the sufficiency of Messiah, a, P, a personal response, which leads to E in the letter, uh, letter E in gospel, eternal urgency. Eternal urgency. Look at verse 7, Ephesians 2, 7. So that in the ages to come, in eternity, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Messiah Yeshua. The gospel has ramifications for the ages to come. For all eternity, for each one of us. Heaven is a glorious reality for all who trust in the Messiah Yeshua. At the same time, hell is a dreadful reality for all who don't trust in him, for all who die in their sins. This doctrine, the reality of hell, it's almost never spoken of anymore today by preachers uh, or pastors or rabbis or teachers. Yet Yeshua spoke of this more than almost any other topic he spoke of. Indeed, it's from Yeshua himself within any other person in the Bible that we learn the truth of eternal judgment. In fact, all the terms that strike terror in our souls, weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, the worm that never dies, unquenchable fire, these are all from Yeshua. The truth is God's wrath rests upon sinners if something does not change before they die. So there's an eternal urgency to the gospel message that we're commanded to preach. Apart from salvation through Yeshua, the New Testament describes an eternity of conscious torment and outer darkness and divine destruction and banishment from God's presence. Yeshua himself in Mark 9 says the fate of unrepentant sinners is an everlasting future filled with fiery agony. So we mustn't be indifferent or apathetic or ignorant or fearful, 
or hesitant about communicating the biblical truth of the doctrine of hell. There's real eternal wrath awaiting sinners before a holy God, which again highlights the eternal urgency of proclaiming the good news of salvation in Yeshua. That's God's calling and a great commission on each and every one of our lives to communicate this. The gospel contains eternal urgency. Lord, help us to believe this. Help us to proclaim this. Now, I admit all this talk about hell is definitely not politically popular or correct today. Some might even say it's cruel. And I would agree, unless it's true. And, I would, and, 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 and if it is true, and it is, then it's cruel not to talk about it. It's cruel to stay silent about this key biblical truth. And that leads to the last letter of our gospel, the letter L. Look at the overhead. A life transformation. So we have, again, God's character. Think about this when you're, you're sharing the gospel. God's character, the offense of sin, the sufficiency of Messiah, a personal response, eternal urgency, and finally, life transformation. Ephesians 2 makes it clear the gospel changes our lives. Look at verse 10. For we're his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. So the picture here is that God, the gospel leads to a radically new life. The, the, the scripture describes salvation as a new birth, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone's in Messiah, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Salvation is not just some, some casual association or some, some superficial declaration. We don't just say some magic words and continue on with life as, as before as if nothing's changed. No. If you've truly trusted in Yeshua with saving faith, there will be fruit. There will be evidence. There will be a changed life. Your life will change. Yes. Why? Because you're regenerated. You're reborn. And therefore, your life will begin to be transformed more and more to the image of Yeshua. The gospel calls you to die to your, to your sin, to die to your old self, to live for Yeshua now as your Savior and your King. God has called you to make disciples, disciples making disciples, people who truly will follow Yeshua as the Lord of their life. So let's believe and live and preach this gospel. And if you've never really truly put your saving faith in Yeshua as the sufficient one, the one who alone is able to save you from your sins, then I urge you to turn today from your sin and to turn from yourself and to turn to Yeshua and to trust in him and him alone as your savior, as your king. This is what the gospel beckons you to do and to live and to proclaim to others. You are called to proclaim this good news to others in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Please know that eternity hangs in the balance for you based on how you respond and equally hangs in the balance for all that you share the good news with based on how they respond. So for all of you now who already know Yeshua, I urge you to proclaim this gospel. There is nothing more important that you can do. People's eternity hangs in the balance. Be faithful to look for opportunities, even this week. The Lord is calling you to proclaim his gospel because he will put people on your path and in your life who need to hear the good news of Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. He is sending you to them, as JB would say. He is sending them to you. Be faithful and obedient to share with them the hope that lies within you. Amen. Let's stand and pray. Hallelujah. The music team, come on up, please. Hallelujah. If you have to call the music team up, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your gospel, for your good news, for your great news of salvation in and through and with Yeshua the Messiah. Your grace is truly amazing. Amen. Help us, Lord Yeshua, to truly believe your gospel with true saving faith through turning from our sin and turning from ourself and turning to you. Lord, bring our sin to our mind. 
And as you do, Lord, we repent of each and every sin. We grieve over our sin. We hate our sin and we flee from it, Lord. We turn from it and we turn back to you. Lord, give us the assurance of our salvation today. We know, Lord, that one key sign that we're truly in you and filled with your spirit and our member of your family is that our repentance and our trust in you wasn't just a one-time decision we made many years ago, but that we continue daily to repent and daily to trust in you and daily to follow you and have our lives transformed by you each and every day. Help us, Lord, to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. To have our hearts aflame for you with spousal love. To do your will. To walk in your ways. And help us, Lord, not just to believe you and to live your gospel, but finally, Lord, to share your gospel with a lost and dying world. Break up our stony hearts. Give us a newfound compassion for the lost who are hurling headlong into hell. Help us to go with your love and with your gospel message to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, to the Jew first, and also, Lord, to go to Egypt uh, and Turkey uh, and Tunisia and Ethiopia and Kenya and Uganda and China and Southeast Asia and India and at the ends of the earth. We pray this all in your holy name. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Bless the Lord.